postmodernists have hijacked that observation to say that well there's no real stability in viewpoint or value and also that value systems in and of themselves are oppressive and always pit the the oppressor against the victim and so should be dispensed with well that's the fundamental claim of postmodernism mm -hmm. value systems should be dispensed with because they cause oppressor and oppressed but the problem with that is that without a value system you have nothing to live for there's no value in anything it eliminates your responsibility if you don't have a value system, so that's a plus. But mm. without up and down, there's no movement up. There's no motive, for, mo motive force forward. There's nothing positive to push back against the suffering that's intrinsic in life. Mm. And, of course, the postmodernists also don't take into account the fact that value hierarchies or, or power structures, for that matter, can be predicated on competence, not just oppression, competence and ability mm -hmm. and skill and talent and beauty and all sorts of things that seem to be intrinsically worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And also that there's a multiplicity of value structures within a, a, a complicated society like ours. So even if you are oppressed by one standard, which is almost certainly to be the case, um, you know, because you're too ugly, or you're too fat, or you're too stupid, or you're, you know, or, or your skin color disadvantages you, or, or you're, you're estranged sexually, or, like, there's an indefinite number of ways that you don't measure up, and that, that society is somehow set against you with a critical eye, but then there's a very large number of games you could play, and just because you're a loser in one of them, or two of them, or ten, doesn't mean you have to be a loser in all, mm -hmm. and the postmodernists don't take that into account, they, they consider the value structure that's the patriarchy and it's universally oppressive mm -hmm. and all the victimized people are the same it's like no no they're not it's wrong mm -hmm. it's foolish it's it's unidimensional it's low resolution it's pseudo intellectual and it's it's absolutely it dominates it dominates the universities because you can learn it in about a, w a week you sound like an intellectual to outsiders and you don't have to do any work any real thinking mm. Perfect, perfect solution. Uh, so in your speech, you spoke about Milo, and um, one of the things, that you, you compared him to a gesture, yeah. and you said that he's a gesture, and I suppose in that analogy, uh, society's the king, whereas the gesture is the only person who could actually be a provocateur mm -hmm. and actually say things that the normal public couldn't right. say it's around the king. Cool. It's a trickster figure, mm. archetypally speaking. Yeah. And Carl Jung regarded the trickster as the precursor to the savior. Yeah. And it's a very complicated idea. Um, what it basically means is that in order to find your genuine voice, or even to move the truth forward, you have to be willing to be a fool. Because you don't know enough, really, to speak on behalf of the truth. Mm. And so by, by even attempting to do so, you're going to put yourself in an awkward position and make mistakes, right? And so you have to be willing to do that, and so that's really Milo's position. He's a provocateur, but many of the people who are coming out in support of free speech, yeah. let's say, are comedians. Joe Rogan's a good example, you know, and, and I think it's because, and one of the things that's really interesting about comedians is that comedians say what everyone is thinking, but yeah. won't say, and that's why people laugh. It's like, um, what's his name? Uh, Canadian comic who's always making racial jokes. Uh, um, uh, the Indian Russell? Russell? Uh, yeah, Russell, Russell Peters. Peters. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's so interesting to watch him because he goes in front of 60,000 people. It's like a UN yeah. wherever he goes. Yeah. And every group is waiting to be insulted and just hoping it will happen. So are, are provocateurs now the free speech activists in, let's say, in the public eye? Yeah. Because they're the only ones who actually have not only guts to do it, but they could say stuff and they could almost get away from yeah, well, like serious public yeah, scrutiny yeah well the thing is they also tend to include themselves in the joke that's the thing about a comedian you know he'll say he won't say you're stupid he'll say we're stupid and here's how and then maybe he'll use himself as a yeah. classic example and everybody goes oh yeah we really are stupid like that and yeah. you know that's a good comedians do that but it's yeah. one of the things that's really characteristic of british comedy because the brits always in their comedy in their satire they always include themselves in in the population of those who, being, who are being satirized. The Monty Python troupe was a good example of that, right? They knew perfectly well that they were exactly the kind of upper-class twits that they were always making yeah. fun of. And so it's like, here we are, human beings, aren't we foolish and ridiculous like rhinoceroses and penguins, yet we have this capacity to stand up above our foolishness and to view it with a critical eye and to, and to separate ourselves from it at the same time. Yes, I'm an idiot, but maybe the next time I don't have to be. Is it th that's interesting because intellectuals do not take that approach when they're in their studies, but 
it seems like comedians are the actual ones who are, um, cause I have way more respect for Milo and way more love for Milo than I do for any sort of, uh, political activist mm -hmm. out there on the left. Mm -hmm. Uh, even on the right, you could see it. People are afraid to say what they want to say. Yeah. And it seems like provocateurs and people like Milo are the ones who actually have the balls yeah. <laughs> to actually well, say what, saw, what's on their mind. You saw that all that, that sort of thing very, very frequently in the 1960s yeah. by the comedians of the left because a huge number of people who were comedians were speaking on behalf of the same ideas that the students for free speech and so forth were speaking out for back in the early 60s. And so the, the, comics, can, the comics can mouth ideas from across the ide ideological spectrum. Yeah. The, the issue is, is that they don't, they don't have to give a damn. Yeah. It's because, well, I'm a comedian. It's like, can't you take a joke? And the, and the more bitter and pointed the joke, often the funnier. The more provoking, the more it moves close to that edge of yeah. forbidden speech, the more funny it is and the more of a relief it is. And so, yeah, so Milo, you know, Milo's a trickster. No doubt about it. He's an archetypal trickster. And that's why people who fight for freedom of speech love him because, yeah. you know, he's, he's bringing that issue to the forefront. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and he's really, he's a really, uh, what would you call it, a very, very unsettling phenomena because he, he, he's got... It's so interesting to watch all the right, young right-wing Republicans in the United States embrace mm -hmm. uh, like this flamboyantly promiscuous gay guy from Britain and, and, and put him up as a hero. It's, it's, yeah. it's unbelievable that he could do that. It's, it's amazing what he's done. You see, it's characteristic of the left to be that way, but now it's the right. Uh, have any comments about like the actual... I think it's... A, the roles I, are reversed is well, what I'm trying I think, to say. I think... I think that it's an indication of the chaos, the political chaos that our society is in now, is that, yeah. that what's on the right and what's on the left is no longer self-evident. Everything, everything is turning into its opposite in some sense. And so it's, it's a very chaotic time. And it's, it, Milo is exactly the kind of figure that you would expect to emerge in a situation like yeah. that. You, he's neither fish nor fowl, right? He's this liminal character that exists on the fringes and, 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 and dances out his antics and yeah. he's unbelievably articulate and and quick and quick-witted and self-deprecating you know he's got an egotistical element he's self-promoting and all of that yeah. but but he's an entertainer and people who are like who are entertainers are like that right yeah. they want to stand in front of a crowd they want to attract attention and there's there's positives to that and the positives are the fact that we have entertaining people and the negatives are, well, it can get grandiose and you can get surrounded by sycophants and sort of disappear down the rabbit hole. Yeah. But, and you know, I think I, I would not know how to, what to predict about his future. He's playing an extraordinarily dangerous game, but he seems quite tough. So well, do you think that's the, the best fight we have against people, uh, th against the left is people like Milo? Well, humor is a big deal. Humor is a big deal. It breaks through. It breaks through to normal people. You bet. Yeah. You bet. You bet. And it also means that you don't, if you're humorous, you don't take yourself with the same deadly seriousness, let's say, that, that your ideological opponents do. And you know that if you're not handling something with a light touch, then you haven't mastered it completely. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's certainly something that I've been guilty of, especially over the last few months, because this has had a you know, it, it had serious implications for my life, and that's made me more serious about it than, mm -hmm. and less able to take it lightly than, than I should be able to, because I should be able to sort of dance above it in some sense. So, uh, Last question. Are you optimistic of the future of free speech in the Western world? And I say Western world because this is a problem that's occurring yeah. in all Western countries, I think. Well, I would say, I, I wouldn't say that I'm optimistic or pessimistic. I do believe that we're in a period of, of archetypal chaos. And anything is possible in a situation like that. And, and small things can be determinants.